as you and it's coming with me it's a baby so i'm not sure if this is a male or female yet but they're too young for just to look at their uh, pedipalps and tell uh, so i can't tell just by looking at this one but hey everybody i see the aunt sandy skinks is here and theropod hunter frank the tank And scrolling down, mysopods with me, Mark Ash. Excellent. Great to see you here. So, zero cool as well, winter. And uh, let's see, did I, I said Mark Ash, I think. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we've got an interesting, hopefully interesting live stream today as I... Uh, prep for an animal program I have tomorrow. This is one of the creatures that's coming with me. I'm going to pull up the uh, Patreon questions first because I want to make sure I don't lose track of those. Let's see. I think the first Patreon question was from Hissy Fit, the Pet Therapy and Rescue Channel. And the question was, a possible question for your next live stream. Uh, when do you separate out cultures, either for splitting up healthy cultures or to sell? Thank you. My clown culture I inherited of 10 is now at 100. I'm blown away. Excellent question. It depends on how often you change the substrate, substrate how often you change out. Um, other things like well, if you separate bait substrate into leaf litter, you know, the, those two things when you change those out. Um, the depth of them, the size of the container when you started, and so on. I'm and also how often you're taking them. I mean, for me, most of my ice, I might be able to do the culture, say, for a lot longer, just because I'm constantly uh, reducing the population to keep it from overcrowding. Um, and I think uh, if you have 100 in a clown culture, and let's say your clown culture is in a six port, you could split it. You could do a 50-50 split. You could upgrade that to a larger enclosure and just move all of that substrate into a 16 port, say, along with a new substrate and be fine with 100 and you could get up to you know uh probably a thousand in that enclosure if you have the right uh, hides and everything and everything set up um you could also um keep it going for a while go up to 200 go up to 300 or so uh technically in a six quart i usually think when i'm getting close to two would say so how is the sound doing now we're back okay sorry we're cutting out i don't know why the internet's so bad right now but it is Sorry, we're cutting out. I don't know why the internet's so bad right now, but it is. Um, am I back? How are we doing? So, Winter, I see that you started a colony of Porcelio Hoffman's egg eye. Um, they're not the most prolific of the uh, large uh, training isopods. A much more prolific one would be porcelain. Hey, they're they're crazy prolific. You could you could do something like that. Uh, Sevilla is supposed to be very similar to that. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that uh, works out well for you. They they're not difficult. They're just not super prolific. So I think they'll probably be. Says I've recently lost a couple of my pods to Armadillidium vulgare, and then since they weren't full grown, I'm not sure why. I suspect they may have had a bad molt. Any thoughts on common causes of death in cultures and preventing it? I always have to catch the replay, so if you don't have time to answer on stream, no problem. Thank you. Well, I would say a couple of different things um, to think about. One is if they're if you lost just two at the if you lost two at the same time, that's a little bit different from losing one. Losing one is not really uh, cause to generalize. Losing two may not be cause to generalize either, but you may have a better uh, chance of being able to figure out there's something systematic going on. Check the ventilation. Make sure there are not uh, issues with food causing a lot of outgassing or molding, something like that. Um, if they look like they died in a molt, then you may have it too moist in the enclosure and not well ventilated enough. With uh, That's the true of a lot of armadillidium. So um, those are a couple of things to think about, uh, and I, I hope that helps. Those are those are my first thoughts on those. Um, so I'm going to start loading things up here. 
Um, as I said, this Damon Diadema Juvenile is coming with me to my program that I'm going to do. And I'm going to have you along for the ride as we pack things up. So, first one going into my bins is this Damon Diadema Juvenile. I'm going to put it over here. I have some of those uh, yellow and black bins, with, which fits the Aquamax colors perfectly. Um, you know, I'm, I have a bunch of those, and I use three of them to do presentations. Let me change my uh, background a little bit. Well, not my background. You're just looking at enclosures right now. I'm going to move things over and show you some other things I'm bringing. Okay. This is an enclosure recently refreshed of Armadillidium gestroy that's going. These are typically my some of my desktop ice pods I have at work, and I was noticing the substrate was getting a little tired, and it was time to refresh the substrate, so I brought it home, changed out about half of it, refreshed everything with leaf litter, and going to be showing off some of these beauties because it's hard to beat these for, um, you know, just general isopod beauty. Um, decent size, easy to, to work with. So I'm going to be showing these uh, tomorrow as well. So this is a program at the university uh, near where I, not too far from where I live. This is the University of Utah. And it is a group of international college students that are learning English as a second language. And they are going to be treated to a variety of my creatures. This is kind of what you might call a creepy crawly presentation, not focused just on arthropods, for example, or just on reptiles or anything. It's a little bit of uh, some reptiles, some arthropods, maybe an amphibian or two, that kind of thing, just to expose uh, the students to some creatures they haven't really interacted be with before. So there we go. So I'm going to put this in. Oh my goodness. I just kicked the wire and unplugged it. I'm going to... Oh wait, I'm not taking... I'm taking these, but I'm not going to show them. i um, just going to take them with me, I think. Okay, next one. I'm going to take... couple of giants. You can see here, we've got a, a high yellow a Porcelio Arnatus with a witch's brew, um, Porcelio Hoffman's egg eye black, and Porcelio Expansus autumnal equinox. These are coming with me as well. This one most likely to be voted a trilobite. Uh, mountaintop horticulture, welcome. So, yep, those are coming with me. They're nibbling on some dog food right there. Um, I think these are a good cross-section of what Porcelio can look like, in terms of coloration at least, and some shape. So that's fun. Um, going to put those in. And this is not necessarily in any particular order. I apologize. I'm just trying to, to get it done. This one, this is a little, this is a parthenogenic a crested gecko in the middle of shedding. Having a little bit of trouble with the shedding, so I put them in this hydration chamber overnight. Might have to uh, um, gently assist with the shedding, but this one is the third parthenogenic crested gecko baby to be hatched in my house. Um, kind of fun. This one we call Little Dude. We had Captain Squinty, and then we had Meek, and now we have Little Dude in here. And Little Dude showed up in October, I think, and like. Some of them, they're very, uh, this one seems to be growing fairly slowly. We are getting to eat crickets. Um, oh, Reuben, Reuben about pre uh, preserving isopods is tricky because they don't, their colors don't preserve very well. And that is why, probably at least part of the reason, I think it was, uh, here, I'm going to pull up something else for you to look at. That's probably part of the reason why you don't see a lot of uh, isopod collections of dead isopods. 
they don't preserve well at all. This little creature is coming with me. Anybody know what species this is? I bet Frank the Tank knows this one. Um, Wanderlust Farm. Any garter babies yet? Nope. But Ruby is looking very pregnant. I think I expect them to be born in about a month from now, based on her past, uh, her past history. But definitely, if anybody is interested in garter babies, all 13 of them are already spoken for. So uh, if you want some, contact me soon. <laughs> Theropod's been planting black poplars. That's cool. So do isopods work in resin? That may be the way to do it. That may help preserve some of their color and appearance. So nobody's given me this species yet. Um, you can preserve isopods in alcohol, but they lose their color. Um, but if they're gray already, maybe it doesn't matter. Oh, Wanderlust Farm's already on the list. Can everybody hear? It sounds like everybody can hear, but Frank can't. That's why he doesn't know what type of spider this is, because he actually does know. He just didn't hear me say it. This one's coming with me, I think. Let me check my list. They have a rotation. And uh, let's see. Just checking my list here. You were close. Well, this is a, a false black widow. So, them from their body shape is a bit different from black widows. There's some other differences. If they have a cream colored um, ventral surface, then you know that it's not a black widow. It is a Steatota gross or false black widow. So Tobias is getting the first mantis. Excellent. So these are mildly venomous, but nothing like black widows, not medically significant at all. Um, so they are safe for me to keep in the house. My wife has requested that I not keep anything medically significant, so I'm not allowed to keep black widows, even though I could keep one in a container and it would be perfectly safe. From that standpoint, I have agreed not to keep some, not to keep any black widows, so I will not. Um, so there we go. I'm going to put this one away, put this one in the bin, and check my list. Um, and while I check my list, I want you to take a peek at these beauties. Just to help me check on them. You can see a ton of springtails in there. But these are my orange Werner I love these guys. Um, okay. I see what we're doing. I need to collect the Venonis. To come with me. So I'm going to be doing that as you're watching these Werneri. Yeah, they, there are some uh, theropod hunters. Definitely no Brazilian wandering spiders. I wouldn't want that in the house even if I could uh, have one, <laughs> to be honest. But um, well, the Brazilian wandering spider, the really dangerous ones. There are some wandering spiders that are not medically significant. I wouldn't mind getting one of those. They're pretty cool. Um, there was one that uh, Spider Cafe. If you haven't checked out Spider Cafe, you should do that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think the internet is, is a little bit bad today. The the Wi-Fi. I don't know what's going on. Let me see if I can uh, get some people to shut off their Wi-Fi uh, in my house. Maybe that'll help. Right? Let's try it. Uh, I'm going to shut off the Wi-Fi to my phone. See if that helps. And just one second.
Okay. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I just shut off my Wi Fi on my phone to see if that helps. And we will see. So let me know if you notice any difference or if you don't notice any difference. There's not a whole lot of people around. So getting other people to shut off their Wi Fi is not going to be uh, too effective, I guess. Um, but we're back. So that's something. I'm going to pull out one of the Venonis. Opilionis. Love these little creatures. I know they freak some people out, but I really dig them. So I have to find one. I know there are loads of them in here. I just saw a ton of them the other day. So unless I've had a tragic die-off, which I hope not. That's... Oh, there's one right there. No, nope, there's a couple of them. Okay, we're fine. Just a little false alarm there. I was a little concerned. Like, what's going on? Why can't I find any? But I see them. Have all of you seen the the video on Venoni's Say I that I did with Clint's reptiles? If you haven't seen that one, it's worth checking out. It was fun. I enjoyed it. I'll say that. Let's take a look at this Bononi say I look at that little alien creature. See the RA naturalist is in here. Oh, green link spiders on my list too. <laughs> that black garter snake found its way back into the router. Okay, Tobias has a question. Possible for diet to change the color of isopod? Yes. If you give isopods a light colored isopod specifically enough foods that have things like carotenoids, astaxanthins in them, um, they will kind of get a sort of an orange cast to them. So yeah, can happen. In fact, some people have told me that uh, they have crossed, successfully crossed uh, orange isopods, you know, orange alevis with uh, milkbacks or dairy cows. And then they send me a picture and I'm like, oh, that orange wash is based on diet. Okay, so I'm going to close this one up. Yeah, I know that Bugs in Cyberspace sometimes has the green link spiders and was working on breeding them. Yeah, um, I don't know if the, the carotenoids and so on have a direct effect on their health or not. I know in um, mammals at least and some other animals that things like uh, carotenoids can be precursors to vitamin A and it's a good way to Good way to store vitamin A. Hold on one second. I'm I'm having some battery issues. And that would be why. Because my battery got unplugged when I kicked my my wires a minute ago. So that would be why. Okay. So anyway, I don't know if carotenoids are metabolized the same way in isopods as they are in some other animals. But uh, if so, then that would be good for them. All right, so I'm going to put this Venonis down and check my list of critters again. Yeah, Tobias, you should be fine giving them the shrimp. That'll, that's not, not going to hurt them. Uh, okay, I've got those ice pods. I've got the Venonis. Oh, you know what I need? I need this critter here. Just a second. This critter here is over in my micro zoo. So let's see if we can get a, a visual on it. Yep. Mm -hmm. There it is. Anybody know this species? I saw buddies talked about uh, this taxon recently. So these guys are this one. Not communal. This is an individual living in this tarantula cribs enclosure coming with me. It's a young one, but it's uh, maybe half grown ish, somewhere in there.
Desert Centipede, yes. It is a Scolopendra polymorpha, as Frank the Tank is saying there. Yep. That's what it is. Okay, I'm going to grab a beetle now. And I hope you don't mind that uh, the background for the default background is uh, my Armadillidium werneri. Oh, I just made a beetle mad. I was going to bring a beetle that I currently don't see, so I'm going to have to try to dig it out. That's not fun. There are so many beetles. There it is. Got it. Okay, this is a fun, underrated desert beetle. Well, it's not exactly desert. It's less desert than some other beetles, but because they live on fungus, uh, mostly that grows on trees, so they're not right out in the middle of the desert desert. Anybody know this species? <coughs> the beetle guy knows. This is a diabolical ironclad beetle. I'm going to talk about it at the, at the program how this little beetle can withstand up to 39,000 times its own weight. Isn't that nuts? So crazy. And uh, that's what this little dude can do. So um, that would be like me withstanding the weight of 193 city buses. 2.9 million kilograms. I'm, I, I looked that up because... Um, since this presentation is for international students, they're not going to uh, know pounds very well, most likely. They will know kilograms instead. So I had to look that up. Uh, very cool. So this is an ironclad beetle that came to me from Bugs in Cyberspace. A few years ago, I don't know, two, three years ago, I don't know exactly. Um, hmm. there it goes. They're really good at playing dead, too. They have some really interesting adaptations in the way their exoskeleton is put together. It's really interesting when um, the exoskeleton is damaged, they can they basically glue it back together because they have all these suture marks in it, and the sutures are put in such a way that they have sort of a a glue in between them, and if they get damaged, they just replace the glue. Like, it's kind of like puzzle pieces with glue in between the puzzle pieces. Oh, the Helbert Diabolical Ironclads love those. Oh, yes, Aunt Sandy, just let me know. The beetle does hire out for moving things. So, um, yep. I'm not sure on the lifespan of, of uh, ironclad beetles, Luch. Good question. Okay, I got the centipede. Oh, I need a millipede now. Millipede time. Mm -hmm. And the one on rotation this time is a Spirostreptus species one. Oh, holy cow. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I kicked, kicked this by accident. So I apologize for that. That must have been really exciting on your end. Um, the apocalypse, basically. Um. <laughs> okay. So Mantis Garden heard 10 years for their life, lifespan. Yeah, I just kind of kicked something and fell over and caused a little bit of a chain reaction. Dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. In the world, you know, that kind of stuff. We're okay now. We're all fine here now. Wow, that was fun, though. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry, that was ridiculous. Um, um, all right, so... I totally forgot what I'm collecting now. I kicked something and 
Oh, Spirostreptus species one. Okay, let's do it. Um, Spirostreptus. You know, I've been doing some uh, some experimentation with my Spirostreptus. I've been keeping them with. Uh, been keeping them with rubber duckies to see how that goes. And so far, seems to be going tolerably well. The uh, rubber duckies, I'm not sure if they're breeding or not yet, but they don't seem to be doing too badly. I think they eat the millipede frass. And, and I'm not entirely sure they're not breeding. I just, I found some younger ones in there, but I'm not sure if, you know, if they're reading super well or not. I hope so. These are also known as the globular millipede. Just bringing that one on some damp paper towel. Very cool uh, Africa species of millipede. <laughs> Young lad. <laughs> Control your strength. I guess I, I need to do that. I've heard of people, Max, Cantrell keeping Platyarthrus Hoffman's a guy. I've never done it, so I don't know much about them, but I've heard about it. Yeah, Therapod Hunter, I, I have some concerns they might be eating millipede eggs. We're going to see how it goes. If it doesn't end up going well, I'll separate them. Um, I have a lot of young Spirostreptus that I didn't produce, but they're growing up really well in there in this setup. But uh, so, what does one have to do to be dubbed globular? They will actually ball up into more of a ball shape rather than just like a cinnamon roll flat spiral. Oh, Luch, you were in the auctions. I just popped in for a few minutes on those. I wasn't planning on buying anything, but um, that's, I'm sorry you didn't quite get that one. Okay, let's see. I got that one, got that one. Okay, oh, next one. I'm excited about this. I'm going to move a couple of things. You can guess what this is going to be. It's going to be a spider. It's my spider keep. That's the one that's coming next. Ooh, I just dropped some enclosures on the floor again. I'm really good at that today. I excel that. I should teach a class in dropping enclosures and knocking things over today. Um, so here she is. This is Charlotte. You can see her web. Do you like Charlotte's web? Now, let's take a look at Charlotte. So, spider warning. Here's a big one. So, if you're uncomfortable with arachnids, maybe turn your head. There she is. A little bit of glare. But I believe these are sometimes called barn spiders. This is uh, Cuculcania hibernalis, black hole spider, southern crevice spider, southern house spider, barn spider called a lot of different things. Uh, and I love them. They are cool. This one is, I've had for about two years, I think. And he's a fun little critter. Does really well, super easy to keep. Hello, McGee. Um, this one is Cobweb Castle. Cobweb Castle produces these enclosures. Um, Elliot at, at uh, cobwebcastle.com. Uh, sent me this to try out, and at the time I wasn't sure I could get a spider. I wasn't sure how my wife would feel about it, but I was able to get one, and I have one, and she knows about it, and it's not her favorite thing in the world, but she's okay with it. It's not a tarantula. Those I, I you know, can't really keep in the house. So Charlotte's coming with me. Charlotte is a showstopper because actually I'm going to put Charlotte back here for just a second because. I need to get a cricket. 
for her to bring. She uh, is usually pretty good about eating crickets right there uh, in front of everybody. She's probably going to duck into her uh, the other side of the enclosure. It's one of the things I love about this enclosure is that um, it doesn't matter where the spider's hanging out, you can see it. Because you can flip over the hide and uh, you know, flip over to the, the dark spot and, and look at her. Or you can flip her over to uh, the other side. And she flips over to the other side and just see her wherever she happens to be. It's a pretty sweet deal. Really like that about it. Um, so, well, I might get the crickets tomorrow so that they can be more gut loaded because they're all eating. So maybe I'll just catch my crickets tomorrow. So I have one, uh, a few crickets I'm going to bring for different reasons. Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, ooh, thank you for the super chat. Really appreciate that. Had your first morning gecko egg hatch. Excellent. The very first single egg laid, too. Baby so tiny. Excellent. Congratulations. Um, the That's kind of what happened to me, too. The first clutch of eggs I got was two eggs, but one of them, it was right on the edge of a, an enclosure where opening the lid uh, damaged it. And so I lost that first, one of the two first eggs, but the other one hatched and was my first successful uh, morning gecko hatch. So. I, I'm right there with you, celebrating with you. That's awesome. And I hope that little gecko does really well. And now she's crawled over to the other side. So love this. That little dome can be removed with a screwdriver to clean it. And then you just check her out on the other side over here. You can always, always see her. So it's now time to catch. A scorpion. Which one are we bringing this time? Ah, okay. So I don't need to catch it. It's already in the enclosure. I'm bringing it in. I was thinking I was going to bring my giant desert hairy, but I wasn't because I was bringing my heterometris instead. My Asian forest scorpion, which lives in this uh, tarantula cribs enclosure. So I'm going to put Charlotte down in here. Mm, let's take a look at the heterometris. Mm, there is that little beauty right there. Try to focus on it a little bit better. Looks like the cricket I put in there hasn't been eaten yet. Do you know of any decently sized herbivorous inverts I can easily get? McGee. Well, millipedes um, are a good option there. Some of the roaches are, are good options there. Um, let's see, what else? Depending on which country you're in, um, if you're in the U.S., this doesn't really work. But if you're in, say, Europe, there's a, a solid uh, phasmid or walking stick hobby, and they are herbivorous. Um, in the U.S., it's pretty limited because um, you can't ship exotic uh, phasmids across state lines. Many, many roaches, including many large roaches, can be shipped across state lines uh, without even a permit. And so you can you could do something like that. There are also some big beetles. I see that the beetle guy is talking about some big beetles, and there are some really nice big beetles. So I think those are some good options. All right, well, I'm going to cover this uh, beauty up. So McGee, roaches are omnivorous, but um, in general, it's not a good idea to give them too much protein. And you can give them a completely herbivorous diet and get them enough protein. You can feed them things like uh, bee pollen um, to give, make sure they get some protein. Um, and there are some species that are more herbivorous than others. Um, and it depends on how strictly you mean herbivorous. Like uh, roaches, you can give them things like uh, low or protein dog food or some uh, fish pellets and so on, where it's not you know strictly herbivorous necessarily, but they're not eating live prey. So uh, it kind of depends on what you mean. But 
in general, if you're interested in getting roaches that are herbivorous, there are some species you can do like peppered roaches that eat a lot of dry leaves and then just fruits and vegetables. And there are a lot of roaches that can do just fine on that diet. Most roaches have bladibacteria that live in their systems and help them metabolize um, food in such a way that they don't need a lot of protein in their diet to be able to produce enough protein. So Max Cantrell, have you seen my video on Porcelio Hoffmanzegei? I did a care video on that species. Been keeping that species for a long time. It was my first uh, large Mediterranean Porcelio. I think I had that before I even had Ornatus or anything. Um, so if you check out that video, it's a fairly recent video too. Um, it's pretty up to date on their care. And uh, I think that would be helpful to you. If, if you haven't seen that one already. Okay, I'm going to have to do some slight maneuvering a little later after we're done with this part of the stream. Start getting everybody situated here. Going to put somebody in there. I'll be right back. I'm talking still, but let's see if I can answer a question while I'm going, actually. Um, okay. I um, didn't see any questions I could easily answer while I'm doing this. So I'm just going to be right back and it won't take me long. I promise. I'll be fast. Hey, my friend, which one, which one are you? Okay. Excuse me, guys. Okay. Sorry. I, I'm collecting a snake right now. I'm trying to prevent um, Edwin, Edwin's trying to get out, so I'm going to pick up Edwin here, and we'll say hi to Edwin. I'm not bringing him, but he is pretty friendly now, so, um, okay, sorry about the, uh, issues there. That's the key to the enclosure, getting Edwin and Rufus, but I'm not bringing, not bringing Edwin with me. Edwin is the plains garter, and Rufus is the, the red-sided. They're all pretty excited about crawling around. And they are garters. Whoa. They're getting pretty active. Edwin is crawling right into the uh, thing there. Did we get another super chat? We got one from Winter. Hey, Russ, how comfortable is Porcelionis prudinosis in arid setups? Think you're making an enclosure with succulents and other arid plants. That is a really good choice if you're going to go arid winter. Thank you for the super chat. Really appreciate that. Um, they, it is a good choice. As long as you have a hydration station for those Porcelionides prunosis, they will do well. I have collected Porcelionides prunosis in the desert, fairly arid situations in a microclimate, like under a stone or something that harbors a little moisture. Even if the rock is in the sun and it's really warm in there, I have found them doing well in such a situation. Very adaptable, and I kept um, Porcelionides prunosis in my leopard gecko enclosure for years, very successfully. So, can be done. It's a good choice, and I would go with it as long as you have that hydration station, or at least one. I mean, more than one would be even better, but you need a minimum of one hydration station in that enclosure, and you're good to go. So there's Rufus. <clears throat> now I'm, I'm getting another enclosure here put together. So Max had a question. Did I miss it? Scrolling around looking for it. Um, McGee, I haven't kept Sevilla, but I hear they're very, very similar to uh, Porcelio Hoffman's egg in care. And in fact, some people say that Porcelio Hoffmanzegei black is Sevilla, and I wouldn't be too surprised if it were a locality of Sevilla rather than a locality of uh, Hoffmanzegei. And I keep them very similarly to Hoffmanzegei. They do really well. So, um, 
Yeah, the inland taipan I'm not bringing this time because it's in blue. Otherwise, that would be a great uh, animal to bring to an outreach program. People would love handling that. Just kidding. Um, okay, who's this guy? Is this my other male? Looks like my other male. Okay, that's what I'm bringing. Woo! Sorry, I feel like I'm extra clumsy today. Guess who I'm bringing today, or tomorrow as well? I'm bringing this little melanistic garter. This is Carlos. I have my two males are Carlos and Cecil, and this is Carlos here. Very dark, almost no white on this snake. Um, just a little bit under the chin. You can see there maybe just a little touch of it under the chin, and that's the only white or even light color on the snake. The rest of the snake is just beautiful black. Um, hard to beat for beauty. Yeah, I, I don't know if I uh, if I can pick a favorite of all garter snakes, but of all the color varieties that I have now, morph, species, whatever included, melanistics, top them. They really do. Um, I am absolutely enamored with these. Super excited about them. And uh, I will be breeding these in 2024. Some of you are already on the list for babies. Um, so there are like five or six babies already spoken for, even though, you know, we've got a year before they're being produced. So and that's if all goes well. But I think I think all will go well. I've got two pairs. Um, I'm thinking of maybe doing a bloodline trade with uh, Don's garter snakes. He's got some some hats, so we might we might do something interesting there. So I'm going to put this little melanistic away because if I don't, I could stare at it for hours and just forget what I'm doing. And they're really they're really tractable too. They're really tame. I think they're uh, on a par with the docility of my red-sided garters, which is something because not all snakes are like that. I feel like I have pretty tame um, plains garters, but it took me a while to work with them. The plains ones to get them to tame down. It took me a lot longer to work with them than it did with my uh, red-sided. I feel like the Easterns, the Eastern melanistics were faster to tame down. So that's fun. Okay. Now, Oh, oh, Aunt Cindy, I see what you mean. The platyarthrus hoffs. Yeah, I, I have no idea about those. I thought you were talking about Corselia hoffman's egg. Sorry about that. <laughs> yep, Mr. and Mrs. Morelia. Um, I hope I get the chance to meet you someday, and I hope we can sit and, and watch uh, melanistic garters together. How about we could go to Clint's reptiles, and, and I could bring my garters. We could do that. And look at all his other wonderful reptiles, too. Um, okay, thank you, Luch, for the, the like spike request. That is awesome. Um, and McGee, nothing is better than black snakes and melanistic garters are like the best of the black snakes. Oh, I like the way you think. Yeah, and Jotaro got uh, the red-sided garters from me, which is pretty awesome. Um, so... Uh, Mentis Garden. I'm actually in Utah, the state right above Peter in Arizona, and uh, in the exact same state that uh, Clint's Reptiles is in. I'm only about an hour and 15 minutes drive or so, something like that, from uh, Clint's Reptiles. Maybe an hour and 15, hour and 20, something like that. And I go down there fairly often, and I, I get a huge kick out of it every single time. So... And I am so excited. I got to tell you, I'm going down to Peter's. I'm speaking of Peter, Bugs in Cyberspace, Sky Island Adventures. I booked a flight. I booked a flight uh, for my wife and I to go down to Sky Island Adventures this summer. So I'm going to be down there. So keep your eyes peeled for that. It's, it's coming, coming soon. Um, Oh, now you can see nothing because the melanistic buried itself. Let's put Rufus there for a minute. How shall we do that? So I'm super excited to go to Skyline Adventures again. Last time I was there it was 2021. 
been a while. It's been too long, I would say. Um, I wasn't able to go in 2022, which was super sad. But I'm really excited to get down there. Been saving up the money for the flights for a long time. And finally got to book those flights. So, look forward to all the videos I'm going to be releasing about that. I would say it's going to be a minimum of three videos, maybe more, documenting my trip down to visit Peter and Jesse and the gang down there, Sky Island Adventures. <laughs> yeah, the Sky Island content is going to be super fun. I enjoy it. So, so Frank the Tank, have you seen the Rust from Aquarimax Pets Best Pet YouTuber video? Because it exists. It exists. If you are a patron of um, Clint's Reptiles, a certain level of patron, which I am, then you get to see the patron-only videos. And one of them was Russ, the best pet YouTuber. On the, uh, was it the Venoni's video? I think it was the Venoni's video that we did together. There was a little bit of a preview of it. Okay, I've got a corn snake going AWOL here and knocking things over everywhere. Um, anyway. He made a hilarious video. It was a full-length video. Uh, Russ, the best pet YouTuber. And I loved it. And my wife loved it. She said that was her favorite uh, favorite Clint's Reptiles video she ever saw. She's probably biased. But So if you are a Clint's Reptiles patron and you haven't seen that, I, I don't remember. It's like the second tier. You have to be at least the second tier patron to see it. Um, but it was hilarious. And it was some things you can just imagine what it might be like. Clint talks about how, um, you know, what you would need to keep a, a Russ happy. And it's pretty funny. It talks about you know, how many arthropods you need to provide. And it's, it's cool. So I apologize for this weird video stuff. I'm juggling a corn snake in one hand and trying to adjust my tripod with the other. So that's exciting. Because here we go. I'm going to put this corn snake who has decided he really wants to explore things down in here if I can get him to go in there. And I'm going to put a hide in there for him too so he doesn't feel too frustrated. I feel like he's kind of almost grown out of this hide but he still uses it can still fit in it and snakes do like that when they have kind of a tight place i have three hides like this in his enclosure one is slightly bigger than this one he does use them all but he still uses the smaller ones more even though he kind of sticks out sometimes so frank the tank i've got a video coming out soon about that but i think dwarf whites are one of the least likely to eat uh, vivarium, healthy vivarium plants. When, if they're not healthy, all bets are off. But as far as healthy vivarium plants, I think um, dwarf whites are one of the least likely. Yeah, snakes do love boxes. I try to provide a lot of hiding places for this guy. Last week, he was lucky because he got fed two weeks in a row so that he, because he wouldn't get fed this week, so that he could go to a, do a program and not have to go to the bathroom in the middle of it or something like that. I've been really good about that, but you know, don't want to tempt fate. I do love this, this corn snake. This is a hypomelanistic, as far as we can tell, we got it as a semi-rescue sort of, you know, online classified, someone was underfeeding it sort of situation. And it was 14 months old and uh, was not near big enough to be 14 months old, but uh, we fed him and now he's weighs over 500 grams and he is about 54 inches or 56 inches. What is it? Something like that. It's a pretty decent sized corn snake. So he caught up.
the lighting looks really funny on him. He looks like he's glowing or something, but he's a he's a pretty snake. Yeah, any any snake pooping during a program, not fun. I have never actually had, because I'm usually, you know, trying to time them carefully with the feeding and everything. I've never actually had one poop during a program. I did have one once poop right before a program, so I had to clean out the box, this box. Um, it was him. He pooped right before a program somehow. Not sure how that happened, but uh, so I just cleaned out the box and we were good to go. But I think our, our Wi Fi is pretty bad, Beetle Guy. Today, I've had uh, this disconnect for several times. Um, I'm going to check my list really quick and see if there's anything else I need to put in the box. I have one or two things that I have at my office that I'm going to use in the presentation that aren't here. And one or two things I'm going to put in tomorrow. Hmm. Hey, where are you going, buddy? Let's not go that far. Um, okay. Oh, you know, I missed one, but I, I think I'm out of bins, and I'm going to need to figure out which bin I'm going to use, because I'm going to bring our leopard gecko, too. All right. Leopard gecko. Yeah, that's the only other critter I need to collect, uh, except for the crickets and the stuff I have in my office. So, Oh, so I see, Frank. That was a little weird for a moment. I was like, what are you talking about? Who are you talking to? And Wi-Fi, okay. Wi-Fi, that makes more sense. <laughs> so yeah i'm just gonna wait till after the stream to put the uh leopard gecko in here because like i said i have to get another deli an appropriately sized deli cup and i don't see one here and i don't want to make you wait as i dig around to find one i don't want to don't want to do that to you so i will just have to dig around i know i have some somewhere i can see one here but it doesn't have a lid and so I'll have to dig around for the lid, see what's going on. Oh, I think I found the lid, but I'd have to dig up stuff. And I set the scorpion enclosure down on top of the lid. So that's not cool. Oh, holy cow. Somebody got loose. How did they do that? Oh, the lid was on loose. Rufus, you little goose. You just slipped out of the enclosure, and I realized why, because I didn't have the deli cup on the entire way um if he had been in the bin that wouldn't have been too bad he would have been crawling around free in the bin but not loose in the house but fortunately i found out about it in time and i'm locking down okay just testing to make sure it's all locked down yep we are locked down no worries rufus has been recovered and this has been recovered and yep yeah definitely better than a centipede loose in the house or a scorpion <laughs> yeah we won't lose anybody fortunately i was right here snakes are right right in front of me so they're off screen uh, other snakes are off screen but they're right next to me so no harm done i would i would hate to uh, lose rufus that would be sad Like spike is a good idea. I think we're going to have to shut down in just a second here. What time is it? Yeah, we've got a couple minutes. So I think I answered all the Patreon questions. Um, just as we close up here, I'm going to put the lid on Mr. Skeletal's uh, enclosure. That's the name of the snake, if I didn't say that before. My son named the snake Mr. Skeletal after a meme. <laughs> so. I'm going to put them down here, put the lid on, and just wanted to give you a little update. 
on this enclosure. This is interesting. This is the microbarium, the first, whoa, sorry. Take a look at my phone there. This is the first microbarium that I set up a long time ago. And put one zebra, very small zebra in there, along with a lot of other isopods. And as you can see, what happened? The zebra largely overtook everything. I've added some other isopods since to try to see if I can uh, get some better cohabitation going. But um, the zebras took over despite... See, this, this zebra right here is a very, very small zebra. And the zebra I put in was smaller than that. And it was still apparently pregnant. So, yeah. That's fun. Um, okay. Oh, 503. Do you have a basking bulb on your morning toes? And if so, what are you using? I just have, it depends on the morning gecko enclosure that I have, but I generally just use Jungle Dons without like a, a UVB bulb. I have used UVB bulbs with them. And I think it certainly doesn't hurt them and may be beneficial. But I haven't noticed a big difference in health or anything when I use them and when I don't. So right now I don't have any UVB on them or heat lamps per se. The temperature near the um, the 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 Jungle Dawn bulbs get, and one it's a Tinkman Herp bulb, and on the other two it's Jungle Dawn. Let's get a little warmer so that there's a little bit of a temperature gradient in the enclosure, which is good. So in that sense, I guess I do have a basking light, but other than that, uh, not really. So the milk back that was in here for a long time and got really big did eventually die, which is sad. And I put a couple of Cali mixes and other uh, milk backs and stuff, maybe some uh, dairy cows in here, and they're still doing okay. That one milk bag that got huge in here was doing fine for a while. Um, Yeah, he was a really nice big milk back and didn't make it. Well, that is about it for this stream. I appreciate everyone uh, participating. And you're right, Hissy Fit, that is the state that I am in, indeed. I probably missed a question about that. So, um, really appreciate your presence. I appreciate the um, super chats from Mr. and Mrs. Marley and from Winter. I appreciate everybody coming. Uh, wish me luck on the presentation tomorrow. I think it'll go well. Love doing this kind of stuff. If I could do it more often, I would. Uh, and I hope you all have a great evening or morning, depending on wherever you are, afternoon. And uh, we'll see you next time. And I would love to see that big old Porcelio Levis, Luch. <laughs>